welcome back to another episode of Dear Found Her. As you just heard me talk about, we have two incredible guests today on the show. My guests are Marcy Zaroff, who is an eco lifestyle expert, an educator, an innovator, a serial entrepreneur, author, and founder of Eco Fashion Corp. And yes, and and Nigel Barker, who is a celebrity photographer, TV personality, and creative director of Yes And. And he also creatively directed and photographed the Yes And's newest Where the Love launch. So Marcy, I want to start with you. You coined the term eco-fashion in 1995. <laughs> I mean, that was a long time ago. And long before we were where we are today, where we're talking so much about sustainability. So I'd love for you to really get us started by setting the stage and telling us how you got here, a little bit about your company, and then how this collaboration with Nigel came to be. Yeah, well, you know, they say the journey of a thousand miles, right? Begins with one step. So I would say that kind of first step for me in um, the path that I've been on for the past, you know, three decades is um, when my, when I was in high school, um, a girlfriend gave me a book called Living in the Light by Shakti Gawain. And it, it struck a really deep chord in me because it's sort of what it's said to me is there's more than what we see. And that sort of led me on a journey where I became a vegetarian. And then I started studying Eastern philosophy and I started like looking at what was out there environmentally. And I started just diving into the movement of like conscious living and back in, we're talking back in the eighties, you know? So, um, you know, I was kind of in a bubble of my own, but it resonated for me. Like this lifestyle just made sense. So when I went to college, um, in California, of course, um, I got a business degree and throughout my years of, of um, school, I was cooking for people and I was learning about organic and natural foods and agriculture. And again, just on a personal level, going to conferences. And, um, and so when I graduated, I moved to New York and I started a school out of my apartment, actually a certification program that is known today as the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, IIN. Um, so I I've heard, of, yes, I know it. So there's almost 200,000 graduates worldwide that are health coaches, um, from, I think now like 170 countries around the world. It's an online certification program, the largest of its kind in the world of holistic health. Um, and that really got me in the trenches of understanding that, you know, every choice we make has the, the an impact ramifications, um, a relationship to your state of health and well-being. And sort of as I was, you know, in that world, I uh, found, I, I met the founder of Aveda and we were at a conference together and it was like, we were speaking the same language in beauty and food. And we became fast friends. We decided to start collaborating to connect food and beauty. And we opened the very first Aveda concept salon together in New York um, as an extension of my school, in my school. And then we, um, through that process, and again, becoming very close friends, discovered that like fashion and textiles and fiber was this, you know, missing link in this wellness equation. And so I was a fashion consumer. I always loved fashion. I always like, you know, was that person that everyone wanted to be like, can you go shopping with me and style me? And I got best dressed in high school, but you know, given that I grew up in <laughs> South Florida, that probably doesn't say much, but, <laughs> uh, but I always loved fashion. So for me, I was like, Oh, and I had this epiphany that I could bridge these worlds, the like the tree hugger and the fashionista or the tribe and the boardroom. And I always say it's styling the world of change and changing the world of style. And so I coined and trademarked the term eco fashion in 1995 um, to roll my sleeves up and connect the dots of this lifestyle. Um, and people thought I was crazy, you know, like, oh, sure, Marcy, like people who are into the environmental consciousness and social justice, like could care less about fashion. And people who are into fashion just think that world is granola and crunchy and frumpy and boxy and beige and boring and ew and like, and would never support that. And I'm like that, but I'm both. So it just, it's about how you package it, right? You see how whole foods and organic food has gone from brown rice and granola to, you know, everything that you could possibly want you can get organic and from even junk food you know like so it's really about you know understanding how to make this movement accessible and affordable and modern and cool and and so 
I started the first sustainable fashion and home brand in North America called Under the Canopy, which is um, was inspired by the fact that we all live under the canopy of the planet's ecosystem together. And because of my background in food and beauty, uh, the, the CEO of Whole Foods asked me to write the business plan to test the textile category. So I spearheaded the very first, you know, fashion, apparel, home textiles, baby, every category with an under the canopy store in store at Whole Foods' first mega store when they when they went from kind of 30, 40,000 square foot stores to 80 to 100,000 square foot stores. And it was a huge success. Why? Because it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Once you plant that seed of consciousness, food being our first basic need, we evolve what's next. And in you know Maslow's hierarchy, it's it's clothing and shelter, right? So, cause you are not just what you put in your body but what you put on your body, everything's an extension of who we are. And so through that kind of making it cool and modernizing the concept, we did amazing. Um, and then fast forward, I you know helped launch the very first organic or sustainable textile initiatives with Whole Foods and Aveda, but then Macy's, Target, Bed Bath & Beyond, um, Nordstrom, Barney's. I mean, I was working from mass to class, working at you know high ed- executive C-suite even levels um, to to you know drive these first time initiatives and over time built my company and successfully and I exited and. Um, got in the trenches of doing consulting. And because I lived at the intersection of food and fashion and fiber, um, started a plant-based seafood brand called Good Catch and a consulting agency with my husband called uh, Beyond Brands. And I was doing a lot of consulting. I authored a book that was published by Simon & Schuster called Eco Renaissance, co-creating a stylish, sexy and sustainable world. And similar to what the story I've told you, It starts with art because we're all creators and we can design whatever reality we wish to see, which is the premise of the book. Through the lens of design, we can change the world, right? We just have to design a different, you know, set of systems and and thinking principles. And so, um, you know, it's, it's been this journey where the book really takes you from food to fiber and and wellness and business and uh, beauty, and it connects the dots through five principles, which are creativity, consciousness, community, collaboration, and connection. And those are the fundamentals that I've built my career on. And so fast forward, um, I also produced a documentary film series called Driving Fashion Forward with Amber Valletta. And I then um, exited Good Catch and decided I'm going to go full steam into my grand finale where I am today, where I always say this is, uh, you know, my my legacy and ultimately um, my last chapter, hopefully. (laughs) Um, But (laughs) who knows, as a serial entrepreneur, it's like the blessing and the curse, right? Um, But but I started a company called Eco Fashion Corp one month before COVID started. So, you know, being in a startup, right, is, uh, you know, got its own inherent challenges. Now you layer on supply chain, logistics, cotton prices doubling, the world in lockdown, you know, it was quite a, quite a ride. Um, But we weathered the storm and came out really positively on the other side, because I think the one gift the pandemic gave everybody was we had to go inside because we couldn't go outside. And it almost forced people to reset their priorities and look through a different lens on health and wellness and sustainability and consciousness and community in the global community, because here we are, who would have ever thought the whole world would be on lockdown together? Don't you think, and I I, I don't mean to interrupt you, because I know you have another piece to to say about your story, but- Don't you also think that part of that was just, it gave us time to think about that. Like people didn't really, I mean, I think about how I was moving before the pandemic and, you know, during that time when we were home, it really gave me an opportunity. I know so many others, a chance to think about what you just said, what's so important to people. And I, I do feel like since the whole lockdown, the everything, there has been a lot more talk about sustainability. Absolutely. You know, and being in the fashion industry, right? Because I, I kind of rode that wave in the food industry. I mean, I was in the organic food industry when everyone in the world who was in the industry knew each other. Like it was that small. You know, today it's a $62 billion US industry alone, 
right? I mean, and I've been on that train. I've, I did policy work to set standards. Um, I spearheaded the launch of the Organic Fiber Council. I was on the board of directors of the Organic Trade Association, which governs the U.S. organic uh, trade and industry um, and, you know, lobbied in Congress and at the White House and, you know, with the USDA. And so I've been very, very deeply involved in, you know, in that whole movement. But the pandemic, you know, all of a sudden, it really was this catalyst to your point of, you know, people are, are starting to think about what they're choosing and health and wellness and then consciousness. And then that is part of sustainability, right? It's, it's people planet. Right. So we're thinking now about the people and the planet and our interconnection. And I always say one of the reasons I started under the canopy and then, you know, some of the brands I have now, which I'll speak to, you know, is with this understanding that we're not outside of our environment. We are actually a part of it. We breathe out carbon, which nature is supposed to breathe in and nature breathes out oxygen, which we're supposed to breathe in. It's an interdependent symbiotic relationship. And so I think, you know, people really started to realize that when we saw air being clean and like, holy moly, you know, and we started to think about health differently because people were getting so sick and there were just so many catalysts. Go ahead. And when it comes to fashion, I think people realize they don't need as much as they thought they needed. Yeah. Like I, you know, I mean, I come from a career of events and TV and, you know, that's what I was doing before we went into lockdown. And even though I do some of that today, I definitely consume and buy just far less in terms of fashion than I did in 2019. For sure. And I think part of it is people were at home also kind of learn being on the computer and learning and seeing and there was a lot of um, really big pushes from like activist communities like remake or fashion revolution that were out like saying, hey, pay up. Don't cancel your orders and screw all those farmers and workers that made your orders across the world. So there was, this, and then social justice became like obviously front and center on every level out there. People were looking at, you know, their fellow humanity through a different lens, right? And then you have, you know, the environmental side and people learning about waste, water, chemical, you know, impacts around, you know, climate change. I mean, the fashion industry, if you include transportation and agriculture and all the industries, that absolutely touch fashion, you know, fashion makes up eight to 10% of the world's carbon footprint, you know, 20% of the world's fresh water pollution, you know, 5% of our landfills are just textile waste, right? And then you look at, you know, in agriculture, and I'm a soil junkie, you know, and especially coming out of food and being in fiber, which cotton grows side by side with food right people think their clothing grows in the department store they don't realize like it's part of nature a third of our world's textiles are cotton yeah right and 60 percent of a cotton plant goes into the food stream so there's an interconnection there so anyway the the point is is that it's the most heavily sprayed industry in agriculture it's the dirtiest crop out there and we're putting it on our bodies our skin the largest organ in our body so the health thing and all of it it all comes back together so talk about your grand finale I mean, you touched on it, but like, that's what we're here to talk yeah. about. So I want you to tell us what it is and what you're doing. Yes. Okay. So I kick off my book with the whole first chapter is called, yes, it's about yes. And, and the whole idea of driving people towards, you know, making better choices is to empower them where it's not about deprivation and sacrifice. It's about value add, getting more. Yes, in food, it has to be taste. In beauty products, it has to be scent and functionality. In fashion, it has to be style, quality, fit, color, comfort, hand, price. And, oh, by the way, then it's ethically made, socially responsible, fair trade, organic, recycled, regenerative, circular, low impact diet, and all that and extra, you know, which is really the juice is value add, right? So it's, it's about no compromise. And so I started a company called Eco Fashion Corp. We call ourselves a greenhouse of brands because we're modeled after the old school house of brands where, you know, we leverage operational efficiencies in the soil really as a greenhouse, um, which is our core values and who we are, our DNA. And we're able to, you know, be able to support different distribution channels um, to drive sustainable fashion forward. So the first vertical is called MetaWare. MetaWare is a turnkey 
plug and play manufacturing platform. So from source to story, we meet brands and retailers where they are and what they're looking for, like build a bowl. What are the stories you want to tell? What are the products you want to make? What are the price targets and, and volumes you want to do? What brand or brands do you want to use? And we'll map out and manage the entire supply chain building up from the raw materials or the farm versus down from a factory where there's a lot of inefficiency, where you're you know, paying for a lot of brokers, yarn brokers, fabric brokers, cotton brokers. In our model, we start at the ground up so we can be more vertically integrated, more efficient and meet you where you are on your target cost, but add all that sustainability oversight, compliance, certifications, and storytelling assets so that we make it a plug and play Intel inside of driving sustainable fashion forward. That's the engine of Eco Fashion Corp. And then on top of that, we've launched a couple brands, two that we launched for QVC over COVID. Um, I was going on air, you know, multiple times a week. Um, one was called Farm to Home. One was called Seed to Style. One is organic home textiles. One is organic apparel. And so we were making the product from our farms. And I was going on air to sell it. So full turnkey model. And those brands are now moving beyond QVC. Um, we're going to be launching in Costco in March um, with the farm to home brand and many other retailers behind that. And then the last vertical is called Yes And. And this is um, the house brand. This is the, if you look at, you know, MetaWare's the engine. Yes, and is the race car because that's what we're, we're having fun. It's what people see. It's how we're going to educate consumers and activate them and engage them and help them understand that this isn't about making fashion sustainable. This is about making sustainability fashionable, right? Because it's cool to be conscious and it's you're not giving anything up. You're you're getting the yes and. So this is a movement. The brand is a right now a women's apparel brand. We have a couple, you know, men's tees. I don't know if Nigel might be wearing one um, today. Just in honor of, the, of today um but you know we have a couple of home items um we have a robe and a, and a beautiful throw we're a lifestyle brand and we're also an eco creation platform so we partner and collaborate with like-minded brands companies technologies um so we have a blockchain technology that we piloted that goes from our farm all the way to finished product with a QR code. So you can actually scan a yes and product in the label and you can go on the journey of the product, full traceability and transparency. That is so cool. Meet the farmers, meet the workers, here are the inputs in the product, here's the certifications. And by the way, we've now layered on ESG data. Here's carbon, water, energy metrics. So you can know that you can look good, feel good and do good in the world. Yes, style, and sustainability. Marcy, you're so impressive. Like I'm like exhausted listening <laughs> to your story. <laughs> like, Sorry. like do you sleep ever? I mean, like, no, I actually don't. And, and I get it because I too am a serial entrepreneur and people always are asking me, do you sleep? And I'm like, I really like, I don't, I go to bed Never at like 12 right. one and I wake up at like seven. So no, no, not really. So I do like understand, but I am like, I am so impressed with you. And I, I didn't know, um, that you, founded the Institute for Integrated Nutrition. I mean, that was like a piece of information that was not in the bio I was given. And that's a really big thing too. I mean, you have just such an impressive background. I, I am like really just blown away by this whole conversation. So um, like truly. So how did Nigel kind of come into the picture? <laughs> yeah, so um, I do a lot of public speaking. I've been doing public speaking for over, you know, probably 20 years all over the world. I've been speaking on an eco lifestyle and sustainable fashion. I always say my business model lives at the intersection of the Lee and Fung of sustainability and the Martha Stewart of an eco lifestyle, right? Kind of front to back, you know, full, full end to end. Um, I met Nigel because I was uh, keynoting at a conference called Fashion Innovation in Miami this summer. And, um, you know, he heard me speak. I heard him speak. He was uh, the other keynote. And it was like, I think we both had this aha, like, wow, I love what you do. I love what you do. And we went out to dinner and just like, it was just effortless. The conversation was like, yes, and <laughs> literally like that is what the brand is about, which is it's everything in style and fashion and quality and cut and comfort and everything that you would want to wear, you know, great clothing and 
all the ethical, sustainable, organic, you know, recycled, regenerative, social, environmental are all, you know, baked into it. So then when and how did you formally <laughs> make this happen? Well, I think it's, it's, it's like anything, it's a relationship, you know, and I think the best business decisions aren't done in a rush. They're done with thought. Um, and, you know, to still step back a second, you know, my career, I've been in the fashion industry for 30 plus years, and I've worked with the biggest brands on the planet. Um, and I've also worked with startups. And, you know, the, I think what I've seen in the industry is that it doesn't matter, you know, ultimately, um, what sector you're in, you know, you're not sort of reinventing the wheel normally. <laughs> and I say normally, because what Marcy's doing with Yes And is actually sort of reinventing the wheel from a textile perspective. And it's the thing is, is it's, it's a wheel that we need to make the world go round. Right. So it's it's not just how we make the fashion world go around. So for me, it was it was very it was very obvious why this was it needed to happen. And when I heard about what she was doing, we met at this event in in Miami for with Fashion Innovation. I heard her talk. She was brilliant. Uh, we had lunch, which rolled into dinner. So it was actually two meals. Um, <laughs> and um, we sort of sat there talking for sort of what was sort of seemed like sort of four or five hours. We then went out with the with the clients and everything else. Continued to talk and brain brainstorm and this continued on and it was actually a process of really a, about a month or so of lots of calls we we met we we went out for dinner in new york city after the fact and we went to events and continued to sort of brainstorm and discuss uh, our ideologies and where we felt the world was going and um you know marcy at that point said actually would you like to and it wasn't immediate it was it was sort of like uh, it wasn't speed dating <laughs> it was <laughs> there was definitely an element of you know discovering who we are and where, where our thoughts are and what we where we think this industry and business could go and our skill sets you know because it's at the same time it's a business decision you know it's it's not just like oh i like you know the way this person thinks which is obviously crucially important but you know where do you fit in the team so nigel i want to bring up something obviously you weren't here for the first part of our conversation but this podcast is called dear founder it is for female founders it is my love letter to female founders that i wished i had when i founded my first company before i sold it sure. you know it's all about how to grow, how to build, how to scale, and even how to sell. And one of the things that Marcy shared with me was that she heard you speak at Girl Up. Mm. And she realized then just how ingrained you were in elevating women as well. And that is something that, you know, I like here in this little container of Dear Founder is obviously so important to support women founders. So I'd love for you to speak to that a little bit. Um, well, first as well. of all, thank you for having me on then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you probably don't have too many of them. I will on, tell on, you, on I, I, I told Marcy too, I, like I, you're the third male I've had here. Oh. Um, one of them was my work husband who is like, uh, he's a baby gear expert. And I, I mean, I traveled the world with him for 10 years and he has made a living out of supporting pregnant women. So, I mean, that's why I had him. And then I had um, Spencer Raskoff was here. He founded Zillow and Hotwire, but his daughter started a social network surrounding food over the pandemic. They did it together. And so he was on with her, but she was like the star. I mean, she, this girl, if my kids grow up to be like this girl, I mean, I, she was so impressive and he was kind of just on. So you are the token third male on your oh, well, token. I'll take token whatever I can be. Um, I I'm happy to be a part of it. I mean, you know, if looking at my career, you know, I've worked for pretty much women my entire career. And if, if, it's, if it's taught me nothing else, it's, it's taught me that they are some of the strongest, best um, leaders that, that I've seen in industry. And, and in it's in large part for, for the sort of the, the, the skill set is very, I think, is actually quite different than, than sort of men's skill sets. And, you know, they have actually everything that men have, but then they have more which is empathy and sympathy and care and grace and even charm and on many levels, which are brilliant tools when it comes to business. 
and when it comes to getting things done and when it comes to understanding you know other people and communication and elements where i've seen ceos um, of other businesses that i work with who you know who are men who actually they don't have these things and they run into all kinds of problems with, with them and um you know certainly for example in the hospitality industry and things like that and you know and then just my own story you know i was you know really brought up by my mother who i'm incredibly close with to this day and and she's actually with me right now and she just flew in from from scotland and she's with me for the next month um and i just photographed her for yes and just now <laughs> just now my mum right? i can't wait to see it she's 80 I can't mother, wait to see it too. Right? And, and so I, I and, and I love her. And again, her I, like I'm like it's cold outside, mom. It's like almost freezing. And she's like, oh, don't be silly. This is nothing. I'm fine. It'll be great. I live in Scotland. You know, so I'm like, okay, mom. She's like blind too, actually blind. And and so I'm leaving her out there. And and she's and she's like, I can't. You know, and I'm holding her arm. It's still nothing will stop her. Absolutely adamant to get it done. And you know, and my grandmother. You know, as I grew up as a child. My grandmother, my, my, so I'm part Sri Lankan, and my grandmother, my mother, both from Sri Lanka. Um, my grandmother was very outspoken as a, as a woman in the 1940s, 1950s, so outspoken that she was actually cast out of her family. Um, she married uh, an English person, uh, Englishman, um, during the sort of end of the Second World War. And as a result of that, um, was they really didn't like that at all, and so it was was cast out of the family. And then she cut her hair short. She was the first woman in Sri Lanka to have short hair. She was the first woman in Sri Lanka to drive a car. Um, things that that were actually frowned upon by the culture in Sri Lanka at that point. And my mother, who became a model and then actually sort of entered the Miss Sri Lanka contest and won uh, in 1967, they used that success to move to England and get away from Sri Lanka. But my, my grandmother, who was an incredibly educated woman, brilliant, um, wasn't able to get a proper job in the UK because she was an immigrant and she was of color. So she ended up doing very sort of menial sort of secretarial type jobs when, it, when she was actually had a degree, was very smart, very brilliant person, very educated, and it never stopped them. They, their, their drive, and I grew up with this drive around me and, and the, the, the sense of family, um, and their care and, and what have you. And my mother looked after my grandmother and my aunt who had, um, who, who was, um, has all, all sorts of intellectual disabilities. Um, and the, but that none of this became, none of this was an issue. None of this was a problem. It was all, this is life and this is how we're gonna deal with it. And so I kind of grew up with those women. And then I kind of went into the fashion industry, worked under Tyra Banks on Top Model, um, saw how she ran her business worked under Naomi Campbell as she ran her TV shows. And, you know, so I've been very lucky to work with some of the most extraordinary women in the world um, and have this incredible matriarchs in my own family. And, you know, my own daughter, when she was born, I, I remember after, because I had a son first and, you know, obviously everyone's like, oh, you've had a son. It's amazing, you know, all these incredible gifts. And, you know, it's fantastic. You had a son and you've got, now you have the son. Everything is perfect. And I kind of thought to myself, that's a weird comment people make. And what do you mean if I now I've had my son, they like, tick that one off the box. Like everything's good. Right. And then I had my daughter and everyone it, and the reaction was 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 obviously congratulatory, but it was different. And I was very notably different. And I and it really was the first time it had dawned on me in that way about the differences my daughter was going to face to my son. And, and what I, and I was really kind of freaked out about it actually, about everything from the fact that people would give you pink and you know, these are all the girly things you needed to have. And, and I was like, well, why would it be any lot different or any different actually from my son? They're like this big, they don't do anything. They've got no hair, they all look the same. Like, why am I treating her this way? Um, and and I, I actually came across the, it was the very first event for Girl Up, which is a United Nation Women's Foundation event. And at that event, I, I listened to what they were, they were talking about. And it was about, you know, women standing for women, girls standing for girls, and we've got to fight this battle. And I, and I was literally a lone man in a crowd of about 200 people. It was actually at Ivanka Trump's house, ironic is that. Um, <laughs> And, um, and uh, I know, right? Um, and it's, it's, you know, the world is full of ups and downs and strange stories and all the rest of it. This is a true one. And, um, and, I, and I, I actually um, put my hand up and sort of spoke and asked if, you know, sort of asked about the men in this equation. 
and which I was kind of like shut down quite hard, but I wasn't going to stop because I thought I have to be here for my daughter. And, you know, in most of these equations in a family, a male is present. You know, this is that, you know, not always, but but often. And, in, and unless we address the entire problem, you're not going to have a solution. And I stood for this and I, I became the very first male ambassador for Girl Up and signed a deal with United Nations Women and actually was quite upset that it was a UN Women initiative because I said this should be a UN initiative. This is not a women's problem. This is a human problem. And, you know, same with He for She, the campaign that Emma Watson launched. I was there at that at the at the UN when we launched that. And again, I said, this is not a UN women problem. Why is this a United Nations women? Why are they championing the, championing this? This is a United Nations issue. And we have to get this on the agenda as a proper issue for all people. Men have to be a part of it. They have to be at the table. And we're asking girls to girl up. We need men to man up. And, and that was the mission. I love that. I, I love that. And so now I mean, you talk about all of these women you've had the opportunity to work with and collaborate with. And now you have the opportunity to work with this one right here, who you missed me say it before you got on. Like I was exhausted listening to her story because she really is just so impressive. And I, and I learned right. so much, even just in the 15 minutes, Marcy, that you shared your information with me. And I'd like for you both to answer this next question. So when, when we first got on Marcy, you made a comment how when you like entered this eco world, people were like, oh, you know, like, like you're kind of nuts for doing this. But then you also made another comment about how it's cool to be conscious. And I would say that is absolutely the direction we've moved towards that we're in. People want to know how to be sustainable. So how is yes and fulfilling that <laughs> for the world essentially, because it is cool to be conscious. And when I like see my kids, they're so different, of course, in that regard than I was when I was for sure their age, they're only nine and 12, but, um, you know, and definitely, you know, later on in life, even like I learn from them on a regular basis. Okay. So no, of course, absolutely. And the next generation, especially because they've grown up on the internet, you know, they've changed the game. They can ask the questions, what's in my food? Who made my clothes? Where's it being made? You know, and they can pull the curtain back and unveil what the human and environmental impacts are. Right. So when you ask about kind of yes, and I mean, the whole concept of yes, and is it's in our DNA right? It's not, we're not trying, we're not half pregnant. We're not trying to be something that isn't who we really are. I was, I've never done anything other than sustainable, you know, CPG, organic um, mindset around social and environmental, you know, accountability, my whole career. So this is about creating a great brand that people want to wear. And then, and, oh, by the way, it's also, so when in the specifics to your question, everything that we do we start with the raw materials. It's either organic or it's regenerative or it's, you know, net carbon zero, still free of any harmful chemicals like tensile lyocell. So we use a lot of mostly organic cotton, which is certified to, you know, the highest standard, same as food in this country, um, the NOP standard. We then move the cotton in throughout or the fiber through the supply chain where we look through the lens of, uh, renewable energy, women's empowerment in the factories, fair trade, uh, ethical principles, and GOT certification, which means, you know, every single step in the supply chain is vetted where there are no harmful chemicals. So no chlorine bleach, no acetone, no formaldehyde, no heavy metals, um, no formaldehyde, you know, no, none of these really toxic ingredients that people don't even realize are going into their everyday textiles. Then we make sure that people are being paid fairly. I mean, it's fair working, safe working conditions, no child labor, fair pay. Um, and so because of our model, which I explained earlier is source to story, we take that the seed, you know, literally when I'm in the farms with women, like I, that's, I cry, like that's where it all starts for me because that's the seed represents life. And we then are, you know, moving that energy up the whole supply chain to a finished garment like I'm wearing that I love that has got all the little details, my thumb holes, it's comfortable, it's, you know, great, accessible, it fits great, you know, so on trend with design. But I know that every single step of the way in this product, 
It was with human and environmental wellness, farmer and worker welfare, and future generations in mind. And we look through the lens of climate action. So I'm a huge advocate of organic, regenerative, and biodynamic agriculture. We have our own farm project in India called RESET, which stands for Regenerate the Environment, Society, and Economy Through Textiles. So we you know, build our own products. We know everything that's in them. We know who's making them. And then at the retail side, we have a couple of uh, Shopify partnerships, one called Recurate, where we have a secondhand resale market for Yes And. You can actually return your old Yes And garments and get a credit for a new garment, and then someone else can buy it and keep it in the system. So that circularity is called Yes And Repeat. And then we have, uh, at, when you check out, we have something called Eco Drive, where every single order then goes and plants mangroves, which are the most carbon rich um, uh, plants that, that capture the most carbon. So again, how, Nigel, do you have anything you want to add to that? I mean, I mean, you know, you, you did say this was a question for both of us, didn't you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, this is the thing, you know, clearly I'm not nearly as smart or qualified as Marcy, so I won't dare to dive into all the details. But what I will say is, um, you know, every day we wake up, we make a fashion statement, whether we like it or not. Um, and, you know, what could be a more important fashion statement for any of us to make than caring for the environment and caring for our planet? You know, we... Um, you know, the, the, the planet is clearly, regardless of whether you're on the internet or not, and, and able to pull back any kind of curtain, you can just look out the window. You know, you can see that in England, we're now growing citrus fruit. You know, you can see that, you know, we, we are having forest fires all over the country and all over the world in places where we never used to before. You know, there are, it, it's, it, we're in serious uh, situations in many different ways, for example, the ice, you know, up in the Arctic is melting way early, causing the, you know, the young sea lions to die because they haven't learned to swim yet when they would normally have pack ice to be born on and live on. Like the, the ecosystem is in absolute disarray. And so when we get up in the, and get decide to get dressed, everything we put on, the fact that it, would, it can have such an effect on the planet. And that in itself is such a dreadful thought. And, 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 and the fact that we cannot, we can actually make a change and make a difference when we get dressed. And the fashion industry is such a huge issue when it comes to the environment that for me, that's exactly where Yes And is making the difference. And it's got this, you know, blockchain technology that you can actually track and prove. It's not just, oh, we're telling you. It's like, here, see for yourself. So how do you translate to the masses and let the masses of people know what it is that you guys are doing? That's you know marketing and branding and, and communication right that's kind of what, what i've been brought in to try and help do and um you know it's it's a, co a combination of things i mean you know marketing in itself is an interesting one you know the the and the marketing of the environment and eco fashion in general has had its ups and downs i mean you know back in the day when it first came out it was incredibly crunchy and it was a sort of granola fied um hippie kind of thing and you know and that was cool it in its own way when it came out, but also it didn't resonate with everybody. And the fact of the matter is the reason why it's such an interesting one is because we're not at a stage now where you need to market the concept that it's good for you. You just need to tell people that that's actually what's happening, right? But because people, we, we, what we're trying to do, with, for example, with Yes and, and with a lot of the brands that sort of MetaWare creates is, is to sort of say, well, actually, you don't have to compromise on your style you don't have to sort of say you can't have this but you ha can't have that this does not available in this color you can't print it like that it's not going to look like this and by the way it's going to cost you way more and don't wash it make sure you dry it like that and all the problems that people then go well, well then i'm going to buy this you know it's like you, you've got to make it easy you've got to make it convenient you've got to make it cool fashionable you've got to make it a part of your life and it's without changing too many parts of it for people and so it's about communicating that uh, and also understanding that you're addressing, you know, women of, of, of all you know, a diverse range of women and, and, and people. Right. So uh, and I think that's another th issue that the fashion industry suffered from is that it's, you know, it's often catered for a, a very uh, s small sort of section of the community that and, and ironically, you know, we market that one section to everybody as if this is the ideal. Um, which one, it's almost impossible to be like a sort of a, a model, uh, uh, you know, uh, physically and, and, and every other way. And, and then also, why should we be? That's not perfection. And perfection is boring at best, right? So it's, I think the, the reality is it's about really um, 
un communicating, creating beautiful pictures, creating great content that resonates with people um, from the soul up. I love that. I want you guys to talk about the new Wear the Love collection and the launch. <laughs> Go ahead, dive in. I'll start by, you know, my favorite quote is work is love made visible. Um, from the prophet, you know, by Khalil Gibran, because when you love your work, it's not work, it's love. And I look at everything that I do as an extension of love um, and co-creation because we're all in this together, right? So it starts with, you know, our product is made with love. I, you know, already walked you through kind of how we think yeah. the making of, right? And then it's, you know, feel the love, you know, on every level, right? It's be the love and it's wear the love. And so that was the inspiration initially in, in creating the collection and in joining with Nigel um, and, you know, I'll let him speak to kind of the models and the energy of the room and obviously co-creation, you know, it's, it's powerful. I always say one plus one equals 11 because we're exponentially stronger together than apart. So when you find someone that shares your core values and you can keep plugging, you, you can be that much, you know, we can spread love that much more, right? From the ground up. So with that, that's the foundation of the collection. There are 11 or sorry, thir uh, 17 styles in this new collection that range from, you know, space dye sweater knit to the, the love sweaters. They're all made from 100% certified organic cotton. And then we have, you know, jerseys and we have ribs and we have waffle and we have French terry and in, in beautiful, soft, organic fabrics all certified to the GOT standard. Um, and everything is just an extension of love. So that's uh, our our introduction to the world. And it's double the love because... <laughs> because I was very lucky enough to be able to, to have my wife and my sister-in-law be the models. So um, it really was a it was a, a bit of a, a love fest to say the least. Um, you know, you know, it was very, always fantastic to to work with people you care about and you love. But that, this was it's obviously particularly great when it's someone as close as your your wife um, to, to work with. But you know, I think it, it also spoke to the story of of yes and it was. You know, th my wife is forty seven, and and you know, between the two of them, they've got five children, and you know, they are mothers, they are wives. They are women. They are real women, and you know. I think that you know. Yes, they are you know yogis and athletes and things like that. But the reality is, is that they they are down to earth um, people who have, live busy lives, and you know to see them in the clothes and in loving them and enjoying them. And then when you look at the campaign and you see like the the sort of actual joy, the dancing that we were doing, the the sort of the, the real kind of cross section of how we photographed and shot it, it it, it shows you that. These are clothes to be lived in. These are clothes to be loved in. These are clothes to love in. And and I think that that is the the fabulous part of it. And you can you can't you know if someone's uncomfortable in their clothes, you can tell you know. And you know it's sort of it's it's like being uncomfortable in your skin. And it's something about that where where people are just having fun, enjoying themselves, and you see that the clothes be a part of that sort of exp feeling and expression. That's what we were trying to portray in this collection is that is the love let it so you can see it so it's actually a tangible thing and and it was very very evident and as were our other uh, great models uh, Christiana and Lindura who were both rays of joy and, and had a great time and and you know I, I think everyone felt like one big happily fa happy family at the end and you know it was the, the whole atmosphere throughout the shoot was very much like that and I'm hoping that you know people react to it in a, in a great way as they get to get to know yes and and, and the whole collection. What are, your, what are the future plans for Yes And? We're just getting What's started. Next? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's a combination of things. So Nigel's, you know, relatively speaking, you know, just joined the brand, right? And and as our creative director, and he's building an, uh, a really amazing dream team of, you know, co-creators who get the vision and share the vision. Um, and so we're just starting to map out, you know, what, what can a, the growth of this, Brand, this lifestyle, this movement, the product collections, the designs, um, what can that look like? And, you know, mapping out co-creation with and collaborations with other partners. So, you know, we started the brand and this, um, you know, started before Nigel joined. We we kicked off with a partnership with Us Weekly, 
um, a partnership with a company called The Knocking, a partnership with a company called Adore Me, where we do we just launched a co-brand this week with Adore Me um, on their site. It's Adore Me by Yes And. Um, and you know, now like there's a whole new chapter for this company and I'll let Nigel speak to it. Cause you know, we, we just have any, we're just at the starting gate. Right. I mean, I think that's it. I mean, when you're, it's, it's, it's so fresh, it's so new yet. It's something which has been years in the making. So, you know, it's, it's exciting because we know that we can pretty much do whatever we want to do and whatever we need to do. And then pretty much in whatever category we want to work in. Right. So that is inc an incredible position to be in. Um, and, you know, you know, whether we want to go to sort of do children's, whether we want to do home, whether you know, we, we, in whatever part of this we want to do menswear, we sort of launched with women's, but this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, and, you know, and this is something which needs to be in everything we do. It's, 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 not, it's, it's a requirement. It's sort of like, you know, it's something we, we owe the world to do it and to do it right. You know, so I think for, you know, the, the future is glossy and the future is also, you know, exciting because this is the the future of the business. So the business side too, I know that businesses, the big and small, big household names are struggling to get into the eco world because they know that that's what their consumers are demanding from them. And the thing is, is that they don't have the supply chains in, in place. So they either have to come to people like us to help them, or they struggle to do it by themselves, or they, or they sort of pretend to sort of do it by themselves. They sort of have pieces of it, but you can't really trace it. You can't really track it always, or it's not really the full story. Um, or, you know, you, or there's elements where, you know, the, the packaging is actually not eco, but the clothes are, or the, the way they're delivering it, or some, some part, some part of that chain is is broken and and you know and so you know the consumer is very savvy these days and they want to know more and they want to know why and they and they they know that the, the the purse is where the power is and so it's sort of i feel that for us you know we, the sky's the limit and you know we want to sort of see where we can take this and what we can do and bring in potential other fabulous designers and and what have you and, and have them become a part of our team and, and what have you well, the world is lucky to have the two of you caring so much about it. And I hope that what you guys are building is going to set a precedent and that other businesses and companies, just like you just said, Nigel, will look to you for guidance on how we can make a more sustainable place. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And then my last question for you guys is what I wrap up with everyone with, and I want both of you to answer, even though you're not a female founder, Nigel. Um, I ask every guest for three tips for female founders, actionable things that they can be doing if they're starting a business. I guess Who wants I to go first? I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll just kick off with kind of the way I am, I guess, inherently wired, but I, you know, um, <clears throat> looking back on my life, you know, because we have this emotional connection, like having heart and being like trusting your gut and following your heart and setting a vision, what they say, Jonathan Swift, you know, vision is the art of seeing things invisible. So set that vision and then don't get stuck in the journey because you have to become a professional pivoter and let go and surrender. And that is like, be in the flow, right? And trust your gut. And there, therein lies, I think, why women are, very well equipped in business because we inherently are connected. You know, we give birth, we have a, we can multitask because of that, you know? So it's just, it's no, don't, you know, try to fit a square peg in a round hole as a businesswoman, like, or a man, uh, any business person, yeah. you know, be comfortable pivoting because, you know, with everything that's a perceived challenge, it's actually your greatest opportunity for growth and for learning. And so I always, you know, I'm, I've been a walking cliche most of my career, you know, like one door closes, another one opens. You know what doesn't kill you makes you smarter and stronger and better and clearer, right? So it really, that does come down to letting go. And, you know, when I was younger, I probably got more emotional, like, you know, and like, you know, kind of frenzied over something that didn't go exactly the way I thought it was supposed to go, but enjoy the ride, enjoy the journey. And just sort of, you know, pivoting of what Marcy just said. I mean, I, I, I sell or everyone and anybody whenever I sort of discuss sort of the, the routes to success and, and certainly in my career and what I've done is that, you know, confidence is key. And there is an element of people like, well, how do I get confident? How do I become confident? And it's, you know, it's, it's a hard one to, to, to sort of 
teach. You know, some people are inherently confident in everything they do, but there's also a fine line between confidence and conceit and, and believing that you are better than everybody versus actually just doing the best that you can, right? And it's giving yourself that right to realize that you can stand up for what you say and what you think and, and, and giving yourself that platform. And, you know, I, all too often in, in this world, we look for other people to, to give us a thumbs up, a heart, a like, you know, whether it's social media or whatever we do. Um, and, you know, the, the reality is, is that, you know, if you're a true artist, you're a true creator, you're, you, you have to be somewhat polarizing in your position. And, you know, and, and that is, you know, because you're, you're not going to have to, you can't be everything to every, all people at all the time. You know, so the, understanding that that's okay. And that, you know, that if you can please yourself and love yourself first and foremost, then the rest will follow. But unless you too do love yourself and care for yourself and, and take care of your health, your fitness and, 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 and you, your thought process, then you're really not going to be doing your best for your company and for the people who work for you and the people around you and all of that. So, you know, I, I sort of lead with the fact that, you know, you've got to do this for the, for the right reasons and set yourself up for success. And, you know, otherwise, you know, you can't really be truly a leader. Um, and and the, the best leaders I've ever seen are the, are the ones who, you know, they, they understand that whether it's their diet, whether it's what they're eating, whether what they're wearing, you know, how they're taking care of their life, all of this is a big part of it, you know, and, and um, some of the, the literally the top CEOs in the world who I know will guarantee make sure that they go and work out, for example, every day and they give themselves that hour, even if it's getting up at four o'clock in the morning to do so, you know, there are things you have to take care of in your life. To make sure that you are the best condition you you can be in, um, that doesn't mean you don't have fun and all those sorts of things. But it means being smart about these things and surrounding yourself with the right people too. You know, it's it's so easy to sometimes you know feel that you have to have certain people around you. Um, you know, even though they're sapping your energy, when actually you know the older you get, the more you know one you realize the less you know. But at the same time, you realize how you know you, you need to have the right people who are there, who are going to make things work, who bring the right energy and what have you. So, you know, it's confidence, it's trust and it's care. I was just going to build one thing off of what, what Nigel said. You know, my mentor of 25 years was the founder of Aveda. And, you know, he also wrote the forward to my book and we were, it was born on 11-11, ironically. And I got married at his house on 11-11-11, oh of course. So, and he was my best man. So, you know, I mean, he passed away and my book is dedicated to him. But one thing he always, you know, two things he said to me, one, which is the kind of premise of my book, um, which is through the lens of design, we can change the world, appeal to people at a visceral level, and then, you know, take them to, into the why to, you know, have them sort of do well by doing good in the world, right? And understand how we can be the change, eat the change, live the change, wear the change we all wish to see. We have that that power. He also said serving others, you know, is serving ourselves, right? Because we are all in this together. And thirdly, he said, it's all about the people you surround yourself with. They're part of an extension of who you are. And if you have the right energy, we're all made of energy, right? Around us with a, you know, as a part of what we're doing, then, you know, we can really be, you know, unstoppable. It's when you get energy gets stuck, right? Law of physics that it can't flow. And so, yeah, I can't agree more with all of that. So, I mean, truly, thank you so much. Marcy Zeroff, founder of Yes And, and Nigel Barker, creative director of Yes And. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with Dear Founder today. I'm so excited to share your story and I can't wait to see where this goes. Thank you.